Ooh, I'm starting on a blank canvas. I'll start with a Flintstone. He's my, he's one of my favorites. It's a long process, it's an assembly line. Think of a line of railroad cars, and each of them has to go forward at the same speed. So at the beginning would be the rider, with, you're working with Joe, and then uh, the storyboard. That was about two or three weeks for a board to be done, a half hour show, like Scooby would be. Then it would go into layout, Another two weeks, I would think, to do layout. I would have a, an idea for a Flintstone episode after I'd finish one, and so I'd go in to Joe and, and say, hey, uh, what about uh, Operation Barney, where he accidentally gets operated on uh, by a, a misdiagnosis? Okay, he, he went with that. Sometimes he would change it a little bit or, or reject it totally or come up with something else. But most of the time he bought my premise, I knew what he would go for. And so he'd say, okay, I'd go back and, and write and board a rough version of it. Anyway, I'd pitch the story to him and he'd say, hey, great, and let's move a few things like that. And uh, this doesn't work. And okay, I'd make the notes and go back and make a second pass at it. And that usually was what worked and he would accept that, and then he would hand it over to Bill Hanna, and uh, Bill would uh, have someone do a production board out of it, which would place all the scene numbers and the camera moves and technical stuff that needed to accompany the visual illustration. And, uh, and then they would be turned over to a director who would time it out on exposure sheets, and they would take the storyboard and give it to someone like Willie, and then Willie, we would take the storyboard. The storyboards were like virtually miniature layouts. So we would take the storyboards and blow it up to what we would refer to as 12 field or full screen. This is what's called a 12 field. And we would do our layouts pretty much to this size. And, uh, or sometimes smaller if we wanted to cut in on a part of the background. We, we would also design the backgrounds and the character poses. And we, that's getting it ready for the animators. Now, if there were any new incidental characters in the film, we would make designs. Joe would have on the storyboard in his red uh, pencil, see me Joe. Yeah. So that means Joe wants to discuss this character. But you don't want to go in empty handed. So you make some quick sketches, roughly like what the writers indicated. Then you take it in and Joe would either okay it or say, hey, give it another try. And uh, from there, the uh, background department got the backgrounds from the layout. And the animation would get the character designs and uh, a Xerox of the, of the layout too. So that split. If you're going down to story, um, and then storyboard, and then layout, then it splits to background and uh, animation. The characters are separate from the background. Exactly. The background sometimes had overlays. Yeah, right. And, and the characters themselves indicated. sometimes had three levels, yeah. like a mask for the face. And After layout, and of course, uh, the director hands out the scenes to the different animators. So the director hands out the layouts that you have made, which is, consists of characters mm -hmm. and overlays, mm -hmm. and he gives that to an animator. And then from there, the animator, it would go to the assistant animator, and then to the in-betweener, which is how I started in the business. Like an in-betweener would uh, receive, let's say maybe there would be 50 drawings in a scene. Some, some were more, some were less. It depends on the, the length. And the in-betweener would do all the in-between drawings, so he would be doing roughly 25 of the 50. And uh, so then from there, of course, it would, uh, it would go to ink and paint. 
checking and camera, and everything comes together at camera, the backgrounds and the animation. And it's shot and then dubbed, and the sound effects are added. It's quite a process. But it, everything has to move in order. If any one department breaks down or there's a mistake or have, have to have retakes, it upsets the whole system. Because we only had about three months to do a cartoon, a half hour cartoon from start to finish. And uh, we had the air dates facing us in the face. And some, sometimes it came very close to missing an air date. And that was verboten. Everything had to be on time. Joe was the creative guy. His two main departments were the writers and the layout guys. We really worked under him. And Bill Hanna pretty much run this, ran the studio, you know, as far as the animators, uh, camera, ink and paint. See, Joe came out from back east, uh, having worked at Terry Tunes and, and, and in the animation business. Bill also came from the animation business, but he wasn't an artist or an animator. Right. Well, they were quite different from one another. They were. They drove different cars. Bill had a Lincoln white Continental. Joe had a shiny black 59 Cadillac. And he, he had a Cadillac every new year. And it, he, he was dark and suntanned. Bill was white and looked like he'd get a sunburn. <laughs> yeah. And Joe dressed to the best. He always had tailor-made suits and had his initials on his tie and on his cufflinks. Bill had none of that. He was a Boy Scout leader. He was actually an Eagle Scout. And uh, he, he was quite the opposite of Joe. Bill was the production guy and uh, sort of gruff and loud, very likable, but he was tough. You know, if you went into Bill and you would ask for a raise, he would say, no, I'm not going to make you rich. Bill had a, he was a hard-nosed businessman and he ran a tight ship. And uh, Joe was more like persuasive and humorous. He, he had a more engaging personality and he had a fantastic sense of humor. If you wanted to get a raise out of Joe, if you could get a laugh out of them at the same time, you're more guaranteed to get the, the raise. I began my career at uh, right out of art school at the MGM Cartoon Studio, you know, in Culver City. And that's where I first worked with Joe Barbera. I knew him because he and my father were friends and he'd come over to the house sometimes. But when Joe and Bill went into business, Joe would ask my father to help out on a development project or even help with uh, layouts, whatever. And, and my father, he, he never said a lot, but he did say, I, I had lunch with Joe last week, and I think I gave him a pretty good idea for nothing. Joe wanted to show my father the this development work they were doing. It was a, for an animated Honeymooners, because the Honeymooners was Joe's favorite sitcom in those days. And uh, Joe said, none of the three in networks were interested you know, in an animated Honeymooners. They got the real show anyway, the Honeymooners. So my father looked at the stuff and he said, well, why don't you try putting him in the Stone Age, put skins on him and uh, give him a pet dinosaur. And so, and he said at first, you know, Joe Barbera wasn't that keen on the idea, but Joe used to do that a lot with ideas. You know, whether it was something for me or Tony or someone else, he'd like, to, he'd go, he'd leave and sleep on it maybe. The next day he'd come back and he'd talk about it as if it was his idea sometimes. There were a lot of dogs in our cartoons. Uh, Joe liked them. And, uh, you know, we had a thing at the studio. Joe says that was the authority. If Joe says this, nobody questioned it. Joe loved to have dogs. And uh, finally, a dog became the, the hit on a series, Scooby-Doo. Because Scooby-Doo was not designed with a dog in the lead. You see, even the title wasn't the same as Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? It was like Scared or the Mystery Trio or something like that. It was a wonderful concept. A Scooby and Shaggy were both scared. Usually a couple in, in, uh, 
comedy would be opposites, like Abbott and Costello, one different from the other. But no, here were two of the same type of characters. It was very funny. And the stories were interesting. Uh, kids trying to solve problems. And at the end, everybody found out it was the landlord or someone else. So there was nothing really violent there, and uh, any young kids were watching um, got a good resolution. A typical day at Hanna-Barbera. Well, it was nothing unusual. It was just a great, I just loved being there. You know, there was such a great group of people I worked with. That's what I really miss is the kind of camaraderie we had back in the 60s and even the 70s. Uh, and there was, you know, less network involvement, which was good too. You know, we just, uh, Joe, and Joe used to look over our layouts and I learned a lot from him, just like I learned from Chuck Jones before that at uh, Warner's. You know, when I started, I was the same age as you, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And stepping onto the Disney lot was mm -hmm. you know, really cool. Especially for me, because I had come from a totally different environment. I had just come out of the Marine Corps, where it's strict discipline, everything is orderly and you do as you're told. Step on a Disney lot, and you know, here's this beautiful place, got a nice desk, sit down, can draw pictures for a living, get paid, well, it wasn't a lot of money, but for <laughs> paid more than the Marine Corps. Well, I would go into work happily, because I loved working there. In fact, I loved every day of my career in animation. But um, I, was, I was doing layouts most of the time, and I would assign myself 13 um, le scenes per day of layout. And I would stay a little bit longer if I had to, just to make the 13. Although uh, we only expected the other layout men to do a minimum of at least six a day. But I kept going, I was sort of seeing how much I could do in a day. So I was a busy bee. Come in Monday morning, sit down, put a fresh piece of paper on your drawing board, and put fade in scene one. And then all week you're busting your tail. And then Friday afternoon, fade out scene 206 or whatever it was. And you go, oh. But Monday morning, you start a new picture. The whole process starts over again.